the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living Could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory To wear my sin and bear my shame The cross has spoken, I am forgiven The King of kings calls me his own Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain, there's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion Declare the grave has no claim on me Then came the morning that sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence the roaring lion Declare the grave has no claim on me Yours is the victory oh, 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 hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. Hi, my name is Joe Sadek, and I will be giving the communion meditation this morning. I have a music room where I work where I have amps and drums and a PA system and mics, but the room's been in shambles 
And the other day I decided I'm going to put my room back together just in case some folks want to come over and play. So, being a guitar player, I was able to do most of it. I got the amps, the PA system, the mics, set it all up. Then I got to the drums and I was doing pretty good setting up the drums. But then I came across two pieces of hardware that I didn't know how to put together. And I'm looking at this thing and I am trying to get this thing put together and I can't figure it out and I'm getting very, very frustrated. And then I realized, hey, my son Alex is a drummer. I will give him a call. So I, give, I gave him a call and I said, because I was frustrated, Alex, you're going to have to explain something to me, but I don't know how you're going to do it. Luckily, he was able to explain it to me. But at the end of the conversation, he said to me, Hey, Dad, I thought I was in trouble the way you started the phone conversation with, you're going to have to explain something to me, and I don't know how you're going to do it. I really thought I was in for it. And we, we had a good laugh about that. Now, in Galatians, Paul wrote a letter to the churches in Galatia, and he wasn't too happy. In fact, if you look at the way he started the letters off, there wasn't your normal salutations and greetings. He kind of got right to the point. He was unhappy because the Galatians were going... Uh, believing in a different gospel than what he had preached. There was a lot of legalism creeping into the churches. And Paul stated, if myself or an angel of heaven preaches another gospel than the one that I presented to you originally, let them be accursed. What was that gospel? That Jesus Christ came in the flesh that he was crucified, buried, and rose the third day, and that we are saved by grace. And that's why we gather about this communion table, to celebrate that fact, the fact that Jesus died for our sins, and by believing in him, we are saved. I have a piece of a tortilla, and I have water, the tortilla representing Christ's body that was broken for us, and the water for the blood that was shed for our sins. After I pray, you can pause the video and take communion. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for shedding your blood that we could have forgiveness of sins. And thank you for rising on the third day that someday we'll be in heaven with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. This is the portion of our service where we speak about giving. Right now I'm down the shore with some of my kids and if you're anything like me, you tend to spend a lot of money when you're on vacation, especially when you're down the shore. And a lot of people are struggling right now. I always make it a point to put the Lord first though. When I'm figuring out my finances, I wanna make sure that the Lord comes first. Proverbs 3 9 states, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your produce. If you do this, we can't help but be blessed by the Lord. If you're visiting with us, please, there's no compulsion for, um, here for you to give. However, members, if you care to give, you can send a check through the U.S. mail to the church or you can give securely online. Uh, let us pray. Lord, take our gifts, our offerings, use them to further thy kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
morning and welcome again to Delaware Valley Christian Church and our online service and we're really glad uh, to have you with us uh, this morning and uh, being worshiping with us and also taking the opportunity to open God's Word which is what we're going to do uh, in just a moment. I wanted to share uh, as just as an opening something that uh, I remember back when I was uh, first uh, a believer in Christ, a very young believer. I was in college and I used to listen to a particular uh, radio program with a, a, a pastor that would be on the radio in pretty early Sunday morning. I used to listen to it and I can't remember the name of the pastor. Um, this was, you know, 40 years ago or so. <laughs> So it's been a long time, but he was a very compelling speaker, and I remember that. And what he would do is in the beginning of his messages, he would uh, start to introduce his topic, and he would usually have a, a, a pretty dramatic illustration of something to start the sermon that really grabbed your attention. And then he would say a particular sort of theme word or topic, and then he would say, let's talk about it. That was his signature line let's talk about it and I always it always grabbed me and I was always looking forward to what it was he, he was gonna put out there and then what it was he was gonna say let's talk about it and so this morning as uh, I, I bring uh, God's Word to you today I want to say a particular word and then I want to say let's talk about it uh, so what's the word well the word is holiness the word is holiness let's talk about it holiness let's talk about it let's first give a very simple simple definition of the word holiness it's not a word that we use very often in our culture uh, in the church we use it a little more often it's a uh, very synonymous to another word we use a little more often than that is righteousness and we'll use that word kind of interchangeably this morning. But the word holiness, very simply, this is a simple definition. You'll see it up on your screen. Holiness is living according to the word and the will of God. Holiness is living according to the word and the will of God. So it, 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 in some ways, it's very simple to conceive. It's living our lives in accordance with the Word of God, which we believe is the, is the Bible, the Scriptures, as followers of Jesus, and the will of God, which ultimately we find in the Word of God. So the idea of living according to, to the Word and the will of God is, is our, encompasses all of our life. It's our thoughts, it's our words, it's our actions. It's, it's how we conduct ourselves day by day, moment by moment, you know, hour by hour, year by year, conversation by conversation, decision by decision. It's what the scripture often refers to as our walk. You know, walk in a certain way. The idea is conduct your life in this way. And so that's what holiness is. It's living according to the word of God and the will of God. In other words, we get our directions, we get our guidance, we get our sort of our compass for our lives to find out where true north is as we come to the word of God and find the will of God and, and we follow that and we apply that to our hearts and our lives and our minds and every area and that's what holiness is about. That's the pursuit of holiness. Now, you might say, why do I bring this up? Why do I bring holiness up? Why do I say holiness? Let's talk about it. Because from where I sit, there is a problem in the church in relationship to holiness. Not just a problem in our church, although we certainly have the problem, but a problem in the church in America as a whole. And I'll just stay with the church in America as a whole. And not go, I'm sure it's a problem for churches all over the world, but I'm just particularly talking about our moment of time, our sphere, and the church in America. And something came out in the headlines in the news this week that deeply disturbed me. And I think this news that came out is a symptom, 
an illustration of the deeper problem that we have in the church as a whole. And it deeply disturbed me, and you may have seen it, you may not have seen it, and it really ought to deeply disturb you as well. I received several texts this week from friends, family, various people uh, sending me these news articles, asking me my opinion about these news articles. And these, this, was, this were people that were both you know, believers in Christ, followers of Jesus, those that are not followers of Jesus at this point. And it was deeply disturbing. And I want to put up on the screen the headline for one of the news articles. And you can see that headline on your screen. And it says, Falwell set to get $10.5 million in compensation as he leaves Liberty University. Now this headline was the last and latest stage of a, something that's been going on for a number of months related to Jerry Falwell Jr., who is the president of Liberty University. And for some time, there have been credible and verifiable news reports coming out, public information about various levels of indiscretion and corruption, abuse of power, all kinds of things related to Jerry, Jerry Falwell Jr. and his leadership at a well-known, one of the largest Christian universities in the world. And so the end result of a long process, which you can read about and catch up on, is that the school, ultimately, the leadership of the school, the board of directors, decided to give Jerry Falwell Jr. $10.5 million. And the way they went about it was basically they gave it to him to go away. And he gets $10.5 million as a Christian leader of a Christian organization that's whole purpose is to, as they say, prepare young champions for Christ. He gets $10.5 million because it says in the article that he, because he did not admit any wrongdoing, nor was he charged with any wrongdoing. Well, folks, let's just say that they paid him to go away. He is not repentant. There's no indication that, that in doing this they called on him to repent. And so why do I bring that up? Because first of all, I find that infuriating and deeply disturbing. It causes unbelievers and believers alike to shake their head and say, what is going on? It causes unbelievers to say, you know, <laughs> they're no better than the rest of us, those Christians, and you know what? They have every reason to say that. But it's even worse because we as followers of Jesus, we as the church professed to a higher standard. And we're so far below that standard. And so that reeks to the community, to the watching world of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. And that's what it is. And it makes our job and I'll specifically be personal, my job, the job of pastors, the calling of pastors is even more difficult. I was talking to a pastoral colleague this week about these things and he said, you know, it just makes it harder for all of us because the world looks on and says, you know, those pastors, those religious leaders, they're all on the take. Let's face it, they're, they're all corrupt. We know that's not true, but it makes it harder for all of us to represent Christ. But, but why, do I, why do I bring this up? Well, I bring this up as an illustration to say there's not much holiness on display here, is there, in this situation. And I would like to tell you that this is an isolated situation, that this doesn't happen very often, but it is not isolated. It's just more public, and it's just more prominent. And so the point I have this morning in opening with this illustration is not to spend time railing at Jerry Falwell Jr. or the school. It's an illustration of a deeper problem in the church of Jesus Christ. And what is the problem? We have de-emphasized holiness 
in our pursuit of Christ. Specifically, we have lowered the bar of what it means to pursue Christ with integrity and character. And we have failed, largely, to hold each other accountable for that pursuit of character and integrity. That's the problem. The things that happened at Liberty University did not happen in a vacuum. They don't happen in a church in a vacuum. They happen as a result of a culture that is formed over time in which people are not holding themselves or holding others accountable for their commitment to following Christ. I've been in church ministry for over 35 years. For over 35 years. So I speak from some experience. And one of the reasons that the, the news that I see with Jerry Fowler infuriates me is because over those 35 years, I have seen a sickness and a weakness in the evangelical church. And that is this. Often and many times, a person's charisma, a person's gifting, a person's ability to bring numerical growth, whether that be finances or more bodies in the pews or more bodies in the school, so often those abilities, whatever you want to call them, those qualities, take precedence over character, integrity, godliness, humility, accountability. And it is a sickness and it is a weakness in the church as a whole and in the church, in the church culture around us. And we have to recognize that it is something that affects us as well. And so, as I said, this is not about railing at a particular church or ministry or at ourselves. It's about examining this topic in our own lives first and our own congregation at Delaware Valley Christian Church. And so in doing that, we're going to continue our series, that, the summer series that we have in the book of Psalms. And this morning, we will be considering Psalm 15. Psalm 15, uh, as we consider this topic this morning. And so uh, we will have Psalm 15 up on the screen for you. Um, if you would like to follow along, or if you'd like to follow along in your Bible, we will be reading Psalm 15. Uh, it's just five verses, not a long psalm, and then we will work our way through it as we consider this topic. Psalm 15, starting in verse 1, says, A Psalm of David. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would speak to us through it, we know, Father, that you want us to pursue a life of holiness, a life of righteousness, a life of following Jesus in our moment-by-moment -moment daily life. We confess that we cannot do this in our own strength or power, so we ask that you would speak to us by your Spirit and guide us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you saw in the scripture as we read it. This is another psalm uh, written by King David. It says a psalm of David, and most of the psalms we've looked at have been written uh, by King David. And this psalm opens with a question, and then it answers the question, and then it ends with a promise. So it's really simple. It opens with a question, kind of answers the question, and then it ends with a problem. So what pro promise? So what is the question? Well, we see that in verse 1, where it says this in verse 1. O, o Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent, and who shall dwell on your holy hill? So it opens with this question, and really the question that is being asked is, when it says, who uh, shall, shall sojourn in your tent, really what it means is, what kind of person, what kind of person, Lord, will you welcome 
into your presence. What kind of person, Lord, will you have fellowship with? And when he used the terms, when David talks about the tent and the holy hill, that signifies the special place of God's presence, particularly in the Old Testament. If you remember when the people came out of Egypt, they were to build the tabernacle or the tent of the Lord, it's called sometime, or the tent of holiness. So they built that tent, and that was the central place in which God uh, particularly identified his presence. That's where sacrifices were offered and offerings to God. And then David, during his time, he built a tent for the Ark of the Covenant, that very special holy box that was in the Holy of Holies that, that represented God's presence. And David built a tent for that in the area where ultimately the temple would be built by his son Solomon. And so the tent of the Lord here, the Holy Hill, is this special place of God's presence, particularly to the, to the Jewish believer, to believers in the Old Testament, to the Jewish people and others that embrace the God of Israel. And so faithful believers would, would come to, this, to the presence of God there. And so really what David is saying, what kind of person is welcome there? That's the question he puts out in the beginning of the psalm. What sort of person has intimate fellowship with the God of the universe? Great question. And I would suggest that that's a fairly important question. Wouldn't you? <laughs> Wouldn't you like to answer the question, you know, what kind of person has fellowship with the God of the universe? I think among questions that could be important in life, that would be a pretty important one. And so David asked that question. And so in answering the question in the psalm, David gives us both a positive answer to that and also a negative description of this kind of person who uh, is welcomed into the presence of God. So in verse 2 he says, He who walks, and let's, say, let's just say it up front, it's he or she, right? It's not just talking about a male here. It's, uh, the scripture often uses the male um, gender, but it's any, any person, a person we could say. He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. Now the idea of blamelessly, because we read that and we think perfection right away. Well, blameless does not so much mean perfection in scripture as it means that this person is whole. This person is whole. It's the idea of whole. It's the idea of this person is consistent consistent across their life. It's the idea of, we often use more of the word of integrity. It's the idea of integrity rather than perfection. Sometimes we'll say about a person, they're solid. They're solid. Well, what's that person like? Oh, he or she is solid. That means they're just, there's nothing about them that's, that's rotten or defective or can bring destruction. You know, we often know that things on the outside can look good and things on the inside aren't always good. A house can look great, but it might be eaten away by termites. A piece of fruit might look great. I've had pieces of fruit that look great, and then you bite into them and like, wow, throw it away. That fruit, that house doesn't have integrity. So integrity is this sort of strength across the spectrum of the person's character. And it's blameless is the word used here, and that's also used of church leaders in the New Testament. The church leaders are to be blameless. Does that mean perfect? Well, if it means perfect, I shouldn't be a church leader because I am certainly not perfect. But integrity, can you have confidence or should you have confidence that your leaders have integrity? Yes, absolutely. Should you demand that they live in integrity? Absolutely. If they stop walking in integrity, should you hold them accountable and should they no longer have their positions as leaders? Absolutely. Integrity is not perfection. Blamelessness is not perfection. It's being free from any uh, significant compromise in our lives in terms of our ethics, our morality, and that is what he's talking about. And then he says the person does what is right and speaks truth in, or really better translation, is from his heart. So he does what is right, lives in conformity to God's word and will, and in terms of speech, which Jesus said ultimately what comes out of our mouth comes from our heart, speaks consistent with a heart that is in conformity to God's will. So God's not just interested in what comes out of our mouth, he's interested in, in our heart. We can put on a good show outwardly, but what's, and so Jesus said, remember, what comes out of our mouth comes from our heart. So that's what David is saying, is there's this consistency between the heart and the speech. And then the next section, he goes on to talk more about speech. Notice in verse three, and he says, this person does not slander with their tongue, does no evil, to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend. 
Now, when it comes to the tongue, the Bible tells us that life and death, remember, are in the power of the tongue, in our words. In our words. We don't think about that much in our culture, that life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's why bullying, verbal bullying and verbal abuse are so destructive. We know that. It's an often neglected aspect of holiness is how we talk, what we say. That would include what we write, what we put on our Facebook page, what we put on Instagram, what we put on Twitter, you know, what we send in emails. Especially important in our modern world where we have so much opportunity to be verbal. And it says he does not slander. Slander is something that we say about another person. This is often all in the context of what we call gossip. It might be something that's flatly untrue about another person, or it could be something that's true, but we've exaggerated it and we've taken it out of context and we've, we've, we've magnified it in such a way that it distorts our, a person's a view of someone else. And it's intended to do evil to our neighbor. It's intended to hurt the other person. And it says he doesn't take up a reproach. That means the idea is cast some kind of slur. That means they don't, that you don't, they don't participate in either spreading gossip about others or participating in taking up gossip. If someone comes to them and wants to spread a rumor or a lie or gossip, they, they, don't, they don't participate. That's what David says is the kind of person that God welcomes into his presence. That someone who's committed to, to holiness in, in their speech and in the way they talk and they realize the power of their words to hurt or to help. I, I, I wrote on my notes, wow, most of our social media would be gone if we followed these, these principles. A good amount of social media would just shut down tomorrow if we followed these standards of our speech and our holiness as we engage in our lives. And I am convicted by these things as well. I want you to know as I went through this, I was very convicted. And then it says in the next verse, In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. And the idea here of a vile person is not just you know, a sinner, because we're all sinners according to Scripture. We all have flaws and failures. It's someone who's deeply committed to doing wrong or, or living outside of God's design. Sometimes it's translated a reprobate, which is not a word we use every day, but it's someone who's really gone beyond the normal resistance to God. The sort of person that comes into God's presence and fellowship is a person, David's saying, who has discernment to know the difference between those who are following God's will and those who aren't. And he knows or she knows who to honor. <laughs> and I think the idea here is that kind of discernment causes them to engage with those that deserve honor and encourage them. And I think more importantly, it's indicating that, that a person's money, status, power is not the persuasive element in the righteous person's holy person's life it's the person's character that they're drawn to so they look for other people of character to come alongside and when they find that they honor that and they encourage that that's part of their pursuit of holiness and i love this this one expression that's here that says swears to his own heart and does not change i absolutely love that it's one of my favorite expressions in scripture of holiness and it's one we don't think of much. It's, it's, it's this type of person, real simple, makes a promise and determines to keep it. Makes a promise and determines to keep it, even when it's not convenient. The Bible warns us about two things. One, to be careful about what we promise to God or others. Don't rush into hasty promises. Often we do, oh yeah, sure, I'll call you next Tuesday. Sure, I'll pray for you. Sure, I'll, oh yeah, I'll be there, I'll be there. Yo, you want me there at five? I'll be there at five. Never see them, never hear them, they never call. They just say it because, you know, it's easy to say, right? It's easy to make promises. Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. And then, you know, oh, sure, I'll give you that car at, you know, $50 reduction. And you call, oh, he doesn't work here anymore. Oh, thanks. Oh, I just, is that what you thought I meant? Oh, I didn't mean that. That's the opposite here. This is someone who, who makes a commitment, makes a promise, and then keeps it. The idea is even when it costs that person something personally. What I like to say is what you promise in the light follow through with in the dark. Hey folks, we live in a day of broken promises, revisable commitments. We see this in relationships, we see this in marriage, we see this in jobs. People just say whatever they got to say, but they don't intend to follow through. And then when things get tough, they're gone. 
That is not the holy life. <laughs> that is not the pursuit of holiness. One of the best lessons my father ever taught me that he inculcated in me and drilled into me in a very loving and powerful way was, Scott, keep your word. Be a person of your word. When you say something, follow through. He, he taught me that lesson. He illustrated that lesson in my life. He, he, he held me accountable for that lesson in our relationship. And I'm thankful to this day. And that was even before I knew Christ. That was just my dad teaching me important life lessons. And then the next one is, he who, uh, next quality is, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. Simply put, this person who is righteous uses their resources for the good of others, not for exploitation of others, not for controlling others, not for gaining from others. Back then, poor people would go become even poorer because they would have to borrow money, sometimes at 50% interest, and they'd be buried in debt. So we don't take advantage of others. We don't take bribes if we're in a position to affect the outcome of someone else's life by someone hands us some money and says, hey, just, you know, we know bribery takes place in our culture. Integrity, honesty. Jesus says you can't serve God in money. And that's what this is saying. And the last uh, part of this verse says, he who does these things shall never be, be moved. And that's the promise. So we see the question, the answer, and then the promise. What does it mean, never be moved? Well, it, it means that we have stability in our lives and our relationship to God. And in the Old Testament, it is particularly used of the idea that this is a person who will stand in the judgment that ultimately is going to come from God. This is a person who will not be moved, not be shaken by God's judgment because they have lived their lives with integrity and holiness and they have lived their lives according to the will of God. Remember, Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about that, that those who build their life on his words, when the storm comes and the rains and the floods, the house will stand. He used that image. It's kind of what it's saying here. We build our lives on the words of Christ, on the words of God. We don't just hear them. We actually do them. We apply them. Now, I just want to draw some applications here uh, for us, very practical, that are very important uh, in our last few minutes. So we talked about holiness, and there's the definition again on your screen, living according to the word and the will of God. So we talked about that. And again, I said you know, the word holiness and righteousness can kind of go together. Let me just say this. Holiness needs to make a comeback. Holiness needs to make a comeback, and we need to help bring it back. It is part and parcel of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation, holiness is part and parcel of the gospel. Now, let me, I mean, this will be on your screen too, so let me explain this to you a little bit, because some of you are saying, well, hold it. I, I thought, you know, you're saying you have to live holy. What, what are you talking about? Like, how am I right with God then? Okay, so there's two things that, that we have to recognize that happen that are errors. The first one is legalism. Now, legalism is this. The idea of legalism is I can be righteous through my own actions and efforts. In other words, legalism is sort of what we saw with the Pharisees in the Gospel of Mark. I can just, if I live right, if I read my Bible, if I pray, I go to church, you know, I avoid these lists of sins, I can be right with God, or perhaps I can make myself more right with God. That's legalism. That's not the Gospel. I can make myself right with God. The Bible doesn't teach that. Then the other uh, end of the spectrum, the opposite error, is called license. That is, I can do whatever I want because I'm forgiven through Jesus. That's the other end. So that says, well, you know, I'm forgiven by God through Jesus through the cross, so it doesn't matter. I can live any way I want. It doesn't have anything to do with holiness. It doesn't have anything to do with following God. I can live just like everybody else, live, live it up to the hilt, and it doesn't matter. Well, that's not the gospel either. That's not, neither of those is what the Bible teaches. So here's what it is, and follow me closely. Jesus, the Son of God, was the only sinless person who ever walked the face of this earth. He lived a perfect life. He followed the law perfectly, like none of us has, and he died for our sin. He took, we, and he took our sin upon him on the cross, including King David's who wrote this psalm. <laughs> So think about that one, because you're thinking, some of you are thinking, oh, David, well, he was no paragon of virtue. No, he wasn't. He certainly didn't live up to this psalm many times in his life. But he was forgiven because of his ultimate faith in the Messiah. 
So our standing before God is based, our standing, our, our righteousness before God is based totally on what Jesus did as we place faith in him. And we realize we cannot save ourselves, Lord. We cannot make ourselves acceptable enough to be with God in God's presence. It was promised in the Old Testament, fulfilled in the New Testament. Okay, so that's the gospel, and that's crucial. But here's also the gospel. We are called to live out that righteousness that we receive from God. We're called to live it out, that holiness in our daily lives, with his power and his grace, not in our own strength. We are to pursue holiness in our lives to close the gap between what we are in our standing and where we are now. So holiness and pursuing it is closing that gap. And one day that gap will be completely closed when we get to heaven. And we are made completely righteous in our actions. And we are to hold each other accountable for that. That's what the body of Christ is for. We are to hold each other in a positive way accountable for pursuing holiness. And I would say this, if a person, if you have no desire for holiness, for following God, living for God, following his word, and no interest in it, then I would question whether you have truly embraced the salvation found in Jesus. At least, I can't tell you your spiritual state. You need to ask yourself that question. I want you to consider these verses to help catch the emphasis of the gospel. Very familiar verses, but we often leave it at verse uh, 9. Notice this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Amen. And that is not, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not of, as a result of work, so that no one may boast. Praise God. That's a very classic verse, important one to show that salvation, being right with God, comes not through our works, but through God's grace in Christ. But notice verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, what's the next words? For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So notice it's not as a result of works that we are right with God, but it is for good works, and that's the gospel. That's the full gospel. Not as a result of works, but for good works, brought together by God's grace. And we have to get that order right. We don't do works, we don't pursue holiness to get right with God. We pursue holiness because we are right with God. So the gospel, I'll put it up on the screen, the gospel is, I am righteous, through faith in Jesus and called to live righteously for Jesus by God's grace and power. Now that's a lot. And I encourage you, if you want to go back through and read, watch the sermon again. It's a lot to take in, that last section in particular. But let me just say this. Let's be committed to holiness in our lives and in our church so we can shine the light of the gospel to those around us. And if you're watching today and you have not yet opened your heart to Christ, let this be the day that you simply acknowledge before God that you need him, that you are a sinner, that you recognize your need for the gift of salvation, and then you can pursue the holiness and the righteousness that he calls us to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for holiness. We thank you that it doesn't come by our own power. We pray that you would use us to be a light to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.